And the reason that's important is because next we're going to set the engine to top dead center. I'm going to show you how to do this using just the magneto, just the flywheel. And this is part of why, um, I don't know, I like to do it this way. Um, by the way, I apologize how dirty this is. I just haven't had the time to really clean it off. But this is why I like it to, to leave the timing chain op side open on this. Because sometimes what happens is you, you're putting something together, especially when I was new to bikes, and I'd drop stuff down there and I'd have the cam chain side all sealed up. And then I had to go crack it open again. So I just like doing everything open until the very end. And um, so, yeah, that's the explanation for that. Um, put the flywheel on. Um, there's no need to tighten it at all. Just make sure that you don't bump it off and it falls down. Um, you know, that's bad. And then you get the flywheel and just turn it. Okay. So you can turn it. You can feel the piston, you know, moving in the ball. And um, once the piston gets to the top, um, I've actually gone too far. So back it out. What you're going to see happen is, um, I'm, it's hard to convey this on the camera, but when you are turning the flywheel, it, it's, in fact, I'll try and show you with, you see how it just tends to bump like that. You go bump one way, bump, you know, it goes back and forth. And there is this little, you'll, you'll feel this, it's like this rocking back and forth. Um, there's just this little hump that it doesn't want to stay at. It's hard to set it right in the middle. That's top dead center. And you can confirm this by looking at it. You know, and setting, okay, it's at top dead center. The piston's at its top, you know, if it's going down this way, it's not at the top, obviously. And if it's gone past, then it's obviously past top dead center. So you want it to be right in that little bump, that little notch, okay? That's top dead center, that's close enough. And when I say close enough, and you might be a little bit scared, but just in between those two little bumps, when it's at the very, very top, and watch it, okay? You see down a little top, bumping back and forth. See how close I can get. I can't even tell if it's moving. No, it's not. That's good. So, um, top. I'm just going to keep doing this so you get a feel for it. How much I move the, um, the flywheel. You see how it pauses right there. Down a little. Oh, come on, focus. So it goes up. Here's the top down a little, back, pauses a little bit, see, and then down, back, pause it, up, down. See what I'm saying? That's where you want it to sit, is right in that, that little groove right there. Um, the reason I say it's close enough is because um, that is, you will, um, there's actually quite a bit, it's maybe like 10, I don't know, five, 10 degrees worth of travel between, here's the teeth, and if you're off by one tooth, it will be pretty obvious to you. I mean, it's not going to be, it's not like it, here you're off and here you're off. It has to be like directly in the center. No, it'll be more like this. You gotta be like that far off before you even, you know, skip a tooth on the cam chain. So it's, it's pretty, a pretty big distance. Okay, so like, that's very obvious. That's too far. Here's the middle. So once you get to the middle, that's where you want to be. I say this because when I was first working on engines, and I'm, I'm kind of explaining this in an annoying fashion, but I'm going over it a lot because when I first worked on engines, people will say, okay, so it's a top dead center. And I say, well, how do you do that? I mean, is, is this close enough? Is that close enough? What's too far? What's too small? You know, what's, you know, not far enough? I mean, I'm here, is this, you know, is, if I tweak it that much, is it off? Or is it, I tweaked it that much, is it off? No, I mean, this is fine. That's top dead center still. Okay, um, that is okay. The little bit of movement is okay. And you'll notice the piston's actually almost not moving. You really have to go pretty far before it starts to go down the ball. Like that. Um, interesting little point. I just wanted to add this for trivia because I like this stuff. So let's say you might have heard of ball and stroke. And you might heard of, you know, pistons and all that fun stuff, but you don't really understand it in, in a visual sense. So I'm going to show you. Uh, skip this part if you like, but if you like machines like I do, you might find this interesting. So, you might know that on the C90, the bore, and what is the bore? It is the distance, the diameter, 
of the piston or the width of the piston. Um, if we were to measure this with calipers, it would be 47 millimeters. This one 47.5 because it is a 0 0.50 piston over. But this, <coughs> excuse me, um, this, um, so, but that is the bore size. It is from this side to this side, 47 millimeters. And in this, this particular bike, the stroke or how far the piston goes from the top all the way to the bottom so there's bottom dead center so that the piston ran away is 550 millimeter 49.5 millimeters i actually think on the 12 volt it says that on wikipedia which is a really horrible place for accurate information um, i have a friend on wikipedia a relatively well-known friend and um, she took a look at herself on there and she found every single fact on there was wrong including where she was born when she was born uh, where she grew up all of that fun stuff it was 100 percent wrong so um just uh, but wikipedia does state that the bore is uh 40 uh, the strokes 49.5 millimeters on the c90s the more modern ones i believe is 50 but what does that mean well, what that means is the distance from where the piston is right now coming up to the top okay so um, now the pistons coming up hello happy and um, the groundhog comes up and it sees its shadow and then it has to go back down for another six weeks or whatever the that distance from the bottom to the top is actually 50 millimeters five zero not because it says 50 years um, and um, so what that is is literally now this piston is five zero millimeters wide so it's the dis that is the distance from top to bottom and how far the piston travels so if you're wondering from the top to the bottom how far does a piston go all the way down and all the way up it's 50 millimeters five zero um, this is why half of the reason why is such a, such a small engine can actually spin much much faster than a, a larger stroke engine because if you think of it let's say you go 50 millimeters from here to here and then the crankshaft rotates one time okay so one time it rotates and the piston goes from top to bottom to top okay so it has to travel a total distance of 100 millimeters okay so uh, one rotation 50 millimeters down and then 50 millimeters back up that's 100 millimeters per rotation but if you have a bigger engine, or listen, I'm not even a big engine, but my car has a stroke of 94 millimeters. So that's about like this. So it's 94 millimeters, but in RPM, um, the, the piston has to go down and up. But my car is a 94 millimeter stroke. That's going to go 186, 80, 188 millimeters for one or two rotations, whatever, it's 188. Um, for going down and up, it's going to be 188 millimeters, but going down and up for this engine is only 100 millimeters. And because the piston's going really, really slow, it's not wearing out nearly as fast, and it's not traveling nearly as far. So effectively, this engine spinning at 4,000 RPMs is pretty much like my car, spinning around 2000 and change um, because the um, well it's a slow piston speed because the stroke is so small and so the distance traveled is so small per rotation whereas this piston um, that you know the long stroke has to go much faster just to go that same amount of rpms if you've ever wondered and um, this is one of my favorite bikes um, is the the honda hornet um hornet 250 um, it says a four-cylinder 250cc bike. Sorry, it's getting a bit long. Um, the stroke is only 33 millimeters. It's literally the piston only goes about that far up and down. So it goes here and here and here and here. And even my finger, it's easy to to go back and forth that fast. You know, uh, not that fast as a bike, but you see how easy it is to go back and forth. You know, 33 millimeter travel. But if I have to go 100 millimeters, it's, you see how fast I have to move my hand. I'm shaking the camera. You see what I'm talking about. And so the Hornet, the Hornet 250 has a red line of 18,000 RPMs for a street bike. 
But you notice if it's only spinning that fast, it has such a, it's a super short stroke that you can do it and the piston is still traveling pretty slow. And that's how you can actually get the, the, the bike to actually work and, and not, not explode is because the, the parts themselves are not rotating or moving as fast as you think. Even though the crankshaft, don't get me wrong, the, the, the flywheel is still rotating at 18,000 RPMs, but the flywheel doesn't know how fast the piston is going up and down. So your pistons are not going to explode uh, or anything funny like that if you keep it at high RPMs. And so if you're a really short stroke engine, like these bikes do, I mean the piston not going very high, uh, not going very far up and down, or I guess in this case left and right, it's um, it, it's not going to really kill it. So 9,000 RPMs is equivalent to running the same car with a double the amount of stroke, which they do exist, at 4,500 RPMs. So um, just letting you know. But this doesn't apply to the flywheel. The flywheel still spins at 9,000. The clutch still, still spins at 9,000. Um, don't ask me how I know that a stock C90 clutch doesn't like to go above 15, 16,000 RPMs. It, it, it explodes. <laughs> so um, I found that out the hard way. So um, yes, yeah, that to address, uh, that to think about. But as I said, um, the piston itself does not travel ne nearly as fast as you might think in short stroke engines. So just a little bit of trivia for you there. Okay. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is I put the cam chain back on. Well, actually, I never put it on in the first place. And uh, you have to start on this side, loop it over the camshaft, or the, the crankshaft, and just kind of wad it up and uh, start feeding a little bit through the, the, the barrel, like so. Um, hard to do with one hand, but feed it through the barrel. You can't feed it through the barrel first because you notice how far the crankshaft sticks out and you can't bend the chain around it and it, it just doesn't work. So you have to feed it through this way. Um, so you feed it through the barrel, you know, wh whatever side. Doing this with one hand, I keep saying that because it's hard. Okay, what you want to do, you see how I did that? I've wrapped it around, make sure you wrap it around the gear too. Um, it's pretty easy, in fact, I'll show you. I like to do, I have to show you things wrong. That's one thing I don't like about walkthroughs, they don't show you the wrong way to do it. So you have nothing to compare the right way to. Okay, you can do, I've done this before, where you think it's on, or it skips off like that. Or, worse, is if you're not really, if you're doing it super fast and you're not paying attention, you do this. And it sort of, you know, if you look at it straight on, you think, oh, it's on. And then you, you realize it's not. Um, so, make sure you get it to see and it can pop off as you play around with it so uh, beware of that okay this is the way you want it to look don't worry about this for now um, just just this is the way you want it to look for now and then with your other finger if you're dexterous or if you're not dexterous if you have fat fingers that's okay um, you can fish it out um, it's all right uh, you just want to fish out the chain so it's going to be in a ball kind of like this it's going to be sitting on the bottom and if you haven't cleaned this part out I suggest doing so, um, but this one's already been cleaned. Sorry, I didn't clean the outside, I just didn't care. And you wanna pull the chain through like this. Make sure it's still on the gear. That you'll, It's really easy for it to fall off. And just let it droop like that. If you're working outside or, or the, the bore is dirty, but if you have actual like loose mud and loose particles, this looks really loose, but it's actually not. I scrubbed it for um, a little bit and I thought well it's going to take a lot more time for me to get all this off so I didn't bother. If you have loose particles of dirt, um, beware, you can get those that grit stuck in the chain. I really really don't, well that's not recommended, I'll put it that way. And um, I, so, so just beware that you know your chain can droop down or if you've got the engine sitting on a workbench and it falls down and you know hits something or there's, yeah you got, and if you have grubby hands, actually that's an important thing, if you have grubby hands and they're quite dirty, wash them off a lot because as you're handling the chain, that grit will come off into the chain. So make sure your hands are clean too. And the same for working with your piston, all right? So I should have mentioned that earlier. Okay, the next thing you're going to put in is the cam, um, I don't know what this is called, um, but it is this black wheel. And um, the first thing I really, really want to emphasize to you is that the good original ones, or at least high quality ones, have this metal insert right here and the crap ones 
don't. You see, this whole thing is rubber. And uh, that's, in my opinion, that's ridiculous. So I bought this to show you. I really did. Um, well, I bought it. I, what I do is um, I work on my friend's bikes um, a lot as a hobby and my family's bikes. And I buy the crap parts because, hey, I can't believe somebody would make them this stupidly. And um, so I'll buy it just out of, you know, surprise. But then I buy it to show other people why. Um, there are parts that are better than others. I don't know, I'm really weird like that. That's just kind of my hobby. So, um, when you get the wheel, um, make sure that it's not rubber. That's just ridiculous. Um, and um, make sure you get one that has a metal insert like this. Um, this one's out of a, well, my original, oh, I think it's the Astria, can't remember. I've got about 15 or 20 of these laying around. Um, the You can check for wear. Um, and it's so hard to find over here. So um, you might ask why I'm putting in a fairly worn out one. You can see how it's got a bit of wear at the top. I'm going to wipe it off. But uh, it's got a bit of wear at the top. It's really hard for me to find good ones over here, just where I live. So I'm going to put in a slightly worn out one. Um, and when I say worn out, I mean, it's still plenty, plenty good. You, know, you can see it's got, um, I mean, it, you can see where the teeth were connect, um, contacting it, but... Um, whereas this one, this is about how much rubber material you're going to have when it's brand new. Now this one can be slightly tricky and half, a lot of the reason why I like to leave this cam chain side open as I put the top end on is because let's say you're a bit clumsy or you're just not used to this and you say okay I'm going to put this on, oh I dropped it and it goes all the way down there like this. Well you can put your finger in there and you can try fishing it out. In fact let's see how easily I can do this. I've done this many, many times, and you notice how skinny my fingers are. I'm not a, I'm not a big person. I'm five foot seven and I'm nine stone, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a quite a short person. Let's see if I can get it out. So you can fish the. Oh, my fingers stuck now. You can try fishing it out like that. Um, I, w I will just attempt this for a few more seconds. Oh, my finger's getting stuck completely. Okay, um, I, I can't get it. I got it to about here, and uh, my finger just keeps getting jammed. But if you have a, you know, if you leave the cover off, you can just reach in and push it back up. So it's one of the reasons I like to leave the cover off. And the bolt for the, um, that the, the <coughs> tensioner that goes into the cylinder, it's going to look like this. And I'm filming this way after. Um, the fact so but I'm showing the part and if by the way if you see me using a large washer that's um, in the later part of the video um, that's just something I used in place until I could find this washer I ended up finding it later um, so I'm going to go back and show you how it um, what the washer is but it's going to be this aluminium washer um, I believe I've seen some of them as copper but nonetheless this one's aluminium slides over just like that and then you are going to install this into the um, into the cylinder and it's just going to be like that. So, but like I said, if you see a big washer I was using, which was this one, and it looks a little bit funny, um, that's just because that's all I could find at the moment. So um, I'm just putting this uh, washer on for now, um, which actually works. You can use steel washers, um, but um, for the best sealing, of course, you want the copper washer uh, or the aluminium washer. And uh, the, the easiest way I've found requires two arms, two hands, um, but I'm going to do it with one, is, um, okay, you see how I'm trying to hold it center? And um, you can put your finger through the other side, that's another reason I'll leave the cam cover off, or the timing chain cover off, and you just kind of walk it back and forth and try and push the, the pin in. Oh, see it went in now. I think it did. Yeah, okay, and what you need to do is uh, you're just aiming to get the pin in the middle of the wheel. And once you get it over, oh, it came out. Once you get the pin over the wheel, push it in. And once it seats, you know, once it goes in, um, you can start, there we go, and start threading it and um, and then you are good to go. Um, of course make sure 
Oh, it's sort of not in there. You see it's crooked. I'll fix that. Make sure the cam chain is on one side and the other. Make sure you put it in between the cam chain. Make sure you don't have both sides of the cam chain at the bottom like this. So it's not going to work if you do it that way. Um, but so, but you can see what I mean. You have to kind of hold the, the black wheel in the center. And I, I can do it with both hands going from both ways to try and keep it propped up. And then I feed in, yeah, with, hold it with this finger this side. I feed in the bolt and then I, I tighten it down um, so that it goes in. Okay, you see how that's lined up now? And the wheel will go, whoops, it'll go, it will go back and forth a bit. There is play. That's totally normal. Don't worry about that. Um, main thing is, is that just to make sure it is centered and that the bolt is attached and tightened down. You don't have to tighten it all the way down, you know, torque it completely, but, uh, you know, do it anyway. Um, I mean, I've already done it anyway. Um, so that's just that. Um, and that is at that point. Um, the next thing that you're going to do is put the this side of the tensioner on, um, that little sprocket. And, uh, yeah, this bi-directional and uh, you're just going to slide it on like this because what we're going to do is we're preparing now and you can see how the tensioner works too you can see how it um, um, how it operates so you know in running conditions and it's uh, you pull up on the chain and um, there, there's your tensioner in action this is a hydraulic rod it gets much much more firm than this okay don't think that's all the tension it has no, that's really really weak now this hydraulic rod really firms up once you build up oil pressure and sometimes it takes a minute or two minutes so um, <clears throat> there's no need to prime it either you can prime it if you want but uh, I'm not going to go into that here now I'm going to take these two dowels okay next what you're going to do is take these dowels these alignment dowels um, of course they slip over the top like this um, and uh, all you got to do is if they don't want to slide in all the way by themselves, it's just encourage it a little with the, uh, you know, with some closed pair of vice grips like I was showing you earlier. With oh, I'm stuck on the camera cable, um, where you don't clamp it down, you just use this as a slight encouragement. Is no, come on, focus. Just use this as slight encouragement. Don't bang it hard. See there, it went in. See. And that's all the, the force you need to use. If you go any harder than that, it's actually going to dent it and it won't work very well. Um, so heads up on that. Um, just um, and, and there's another one that's going to go up here. Top left. Alignment dowel, see? And uh, here we'll, we'll do this one in front of you so you get a better idea. See how, see how little force I'm using? That's the most you're going to need to use, is something like that. And you see, it's already in, just like that. Um, it's got a little bit of dinghies, you know, on the side, a little bit of uh, scratches and whatnot. Um, if you've got pieces of metal coming off, um, pull that off, you know, wipe it off. Make sure it's not that way, but you know, just little scratches like that, it's okay. It's not a very important piece. I mean, it's important, but it's not, um, if it's scratched, it's not going to be the end of the world. Sorry, my camera crashed and I lost a bunch of footage, so if I seem a bit irritated, I apologize for that. Um, it's uh, dealing with technology these days. Um, so anyway, what I was trying to reference on the cylinder, the next step I was trying to reference was talking about the rocker uh, shaft. Okay, what is the rocker shaft? Well, you have to understand what the rocker arms are. So um, the camshaft, you can see the, those lobes down there that they're going back and forth like this. Um, and what they are, like um, the and those lobes, obviously they don't ac actuate the shaft, um, the rocker arm until they contact it, um, and this is you know, of course determined by the rotation of the engine. Uh, you can see it more clearly on this other head. Uh, you can see the port size is a lot bigger on this one, and uh, more air means more power. Um, of course, if you, you have to tune it right and jet it right and everything, but um, I want the more power. So um, just quick explanation. So when you see me not using the genuine Honda head and going for the aftermarket head, um, that's why I'm just I want to experiment with um, you know a bigger port and getting a little bit more power. Um, but anyway, 
um, back onto the rocker arm. When the rocker arm is actuated by the cam lobe, that pushes down, and this is your valve, this is the top of the valve, and that's what pushes down on the valve. Now there's not this much clearance normally, um, this is just exaggerated to show you what I'm talking about. But anyway, what does this arm pivot on? Well, th that pivots on the rocker shaft, okay? So because it pivots on that shaft, um, uh, you have to have a shaft in there so that it can pivot. But um, with these, is they have a tendency to fall, not fall out, but to back out just to the point where they can be obstructive. You see what, what I just did? Okay, so here, look inside here, and you see where the shaft is. But um, if I'm trying to put the head stud, just pretend for a moment this is your head stud, and when I'm trying to slip it in, you see that I get stuck because the shaft is in the way. And especially if you are having some trouble putting on the head and it wiggles around, sometimes what can happen is the shaft can just back out ever so slightly over the hole. You can see there's the hole right there. And you can't get anything through. So if you're trying to slip on the cylinder head and it seems to get stuck, like it'll slip on very, simp uh, very easily. In fact, let's just do it for you. The head should slide very, very easily. You know, a little bit of wiggling is required, you can see that. But if it does that, and you hear it go thunk, well, and you keep trying to bang it, bang it, push it, and you say, well, there's something must be in the way, but then you, you know, you take it off and you, you can't figure it out, or, or you, you're just not sure what's going on. Um, what often happens, especially if you've been moving stuff around, is, as I was just saying, the rocker shaft has fallen slightly out, like that. So all you need to do, and, and by the way, it's threaded inside. See that? See? Sort of. It's not really showing up. But um, there are some threads inside. So all you need to do is, you can just put a bolt in there, and you can rest it, you can get a grip on it, by pushing, exerting a little force down, and just pushing it in. It's not going to slip. You don't have to try and hit the edge of the bolt. You can actually stick the bolt inside. And, and that's how you can pull it out too. You see how I'm pulling it out just like that. Um, the rocker arm actually fell off as I was putting that in. But you see there's, let me, maybe you can, oh, you can see the threads, yes. So the threads offer a bit of grip if you just use a bolt. So you can, now I've got to center the rocker arm. So what you can do is when you push it in, just put the bolt inside the rocker shaft. Don't you don't have to try and hit the edge of it, and you can also score the area on the outside or the um, the housing. You don't want to do that, so you can put the bolt in like this, push downward, and voila, slides in just like that. And you can see that now it is clear of the hole. But yes, that does happen from time to time, so um, um, please keep that in mind. Okay, let's put the cylinder head. I don't. Um, if you happen to buy a new head, okay, um, I usually leave the, the, the valve covers off, like this. I leave them off, and um, I, I leave this plate off. If you're wondering what that plate is, that is the oil cooler block, or the oil flow redirect plate. But if you want some extra cooling, and um, and uh, by the way, if um, you have a stock machine, just a regular C90, and it's um, as long as it's in decent condition, and it's not 40 degrees C outside, like where it is half of the time where I live, um, you're fine for cooling in terms of airflow. So um, if you're really thinking about an oil cooler or whatnot, it's not entirely necessary. Also, uh, oil coolers disrupt the oil flow rate and uh, it disrupts the warm-up time too because it takes a lot, t a lot longer for the engine to warm up um, all that oil, and so I um, mean it will keep it cooler for longer. So it might actually do your engine more damage because it doesn't heat up quickly enough. Um, that's just one of those things. Um, so in case you were thinking, well, I really, really want an oil cooler or not, unless you are experiencing overheating problems, in this case, like me, where I was in really slow traffic with no oil, uh, no airflow, and, um, and it was very hot, you know, 40 degrees C, and of course the pavement um, was even hotter, um, I did get occasional overheating problems, but you should be fine. Okay, so as long as you get some sufficient airflow over the engine, 
um, you should be okay. So that's just a note over here. But for so if I seem like I'm talking a little bit too much about trying to keep an engine cool and trying to talk about extra oil, um, getting extra oil flow and everything and making sure that you have a big oil pump, and that's just kind of because I live in a really, really hot area and I'm in urban traffic half of the time and so often uh, the engines just bake over here. Um, so that's just that that's just uh, me. So I like to leave off the block. Uh, um, I leave off this plate. Um, trying to think why I do that though. Um, I, I honestly could. Oh yeah, you, you, um, you don't. Okay, you don't have to. If it's got the two bolts in there and you don't want to crack the gasket off, you don't have to. You can leave it on. But this center bolt has to come out because that center bolt is this one, the one I've been pointing with. It's very long. It goes all the way through, and it holds down. There you go, and it holds down this guy, which is the cover. Oh, I can pick up the whole head. So it's the cover like this, and of course you're going to leave the cover off. Um, I think that should be. Oh yes, yes. One, one last thing. These valve covers. Um, some of the uh, uh, the life ends for me were particularly bad, but this was about three years ago. So they may have improved their quality since then. So take it with a grain of salt. It's uh, 2017, um, February 2017. I'm sorry, March, March 2017 right now. Okay, so March uh, 2017 um, and about three years ago, um, several heads, I think it was all of them actually, the valve cover gaskets, the little O-rings that go in there, I wish I brought some, didn't. Um, <clears throat> were really really oh no i'll have some give me a second i'll go fish them out amazingly i even saved the gasket this is the literal one that i was saved because um I, I i'm surprised i brought it with me but what happened with this one is that uh, this is what it came with and i don't know if you can see this the detail on the camera but it is plasticky it, it's almost like it's made of composite or something it does not bend hardly at all i mean look at it. you can see it's it's holding its shape like so it's got very little elasticity in fact it doesn't even seem to want to go back into place now whereas a good set is is actual rubber I and mean, you can see it finally starting to go up but the point is then this one's made of rubber and actual flexible rubber and um so i'll put these oh, i'll just have the engine together again this is from 2012 2013 and this was for life n90 this was like for the 110 so um yeah different engine but um maybe probably a different factory tell you the truth um but the point is is that it came with these and immediately they leaked it was so bad that it, it just i started it wasn't a big leak but it was it was a small amount a small amount of dribble coming out the side and uh, it really irritated me, and I so I had to buy new of these and replace them almost immediately. Um, I'm sure that they got better after that because um, it's not like life ends are only exported. I mean, they're for the Chinese market too, and I'm sure the Chinese weren't too happy with that either. As I said, I bought one of the most, uh, one of the most early. I bought a pretty early engine, but um, just an, a thing to inspect is if you, uh, when you remove the covers. Um, Check the O-rings that make sure they're the appropriate size and that they are spongy, like that uh, bouncy rather than a hard piece of plastic like this. Okay, um, so that is the last part about if you buy a new head and what to check for. Uh, as I've said, I'm pretty sure the newer engines are much better than that, but um, you know, just a double, triple checking. This also will show you what parts are which um, and give you a good idea. Um, okay, now at this point, let us put in this shape, we can put the engine on. Um, and um, this, now there is clearance between here. These valve clearances have already been set. I'll reset set them again later, but um, make sure there's clearance between here so that the camshaft, you can see it rotates freely. I'm just moving it with my two fingers, okay? Um, make sure that it rotates freely and that there's a little bit of clearance. You can't hear it, but I can feel it. It's uh, tapping up and down very, very slightly. Um, and get ready to install the head. Also, um, at this point, you want it to the camshaft to be able to rotate. You can see the lobes inside, and you want the two lobes to be facing down. Okay, down, because you see how I can wiggle this back and forth. If the lobes are facing up, it's actually going to have some of the valve. It's going to have both of the valves somewhat open, and you don't want that. It will also be very, very stiff to turn. So you want to make sure that the camshaft is you're able to rotate it very freely like I'm doing here. 
Okay. Um, oh yeah. Also, some um, some engines have a two bolt cam. There we go. I've got another head to show you this on. Uh, you might have. Um, actually, I've seen a majority of the twelve volt cubs I've used. Um, I've had look like this, not like this. So you can see you can't even see the bearing. The bearing is actually on the inside. Whereas this one, the bearing is on the outside. This is the majority of 12 volt cubs. Uh, 50, 70, this is off of the C50. Um, this is actually my old C50, it's, uh, well, I still have it. And, uh, and you can see though, the same, the lobes are, it's so cute, those little rocket arms, aren't you? They're so small. I mean, look at that, there's, there's a 90 and then there's the 50, they're so tiny. I'm sorry, <laughs> getting off subject, uh, getting off, um, um, tangent here, but you can see how the lobes again they're they're on the bottom, and these are on the top uh, or on the on the bottom too, so they're both on the bottom and um so that's what you want and um when you are putting the head on, it will be well it'll be going sideways and uh you you want the the bolts the bolt holes to be i mean for top dead center they're gonna be flat like that flat meaning you know uh, parallel to the ground and they will move about this much from about seven o'clock seven o'clock to about uh, uh, ten um, ish and that is what you want and that's the position you want it to be in when you set the head um, I'll just give I'll, I'll just show you what a, the, the other C50 also as I said your, your oil plate might look a bit different you see how this one is really small and square and the other one the fins are actually skinnier, but the, the plate is much wider, so there you go. Difference on that, and um, and by the way, I was talking about valve cover gaskets. You see this one? Um, this is where they would go, and uh, so that's what I was talking about, valve cover gaskets, the little o-ring that goes inside here. Okay, um, just a clarification on that one. But before you put this on, before you put it on, if you have um, a oil feed o-ring, and you will tell if your bike has this, you can tell, is um, you're going to have to put the o-ring on before you put the cylinder head on. The o-ring has to go on first, so don't make that mistake that I did and I have to refill everything. So put this O-ring on first, because obviously once you slide on the head, this is going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to get it on. This O-ring down here, I'm going to describe, I'm going to talk about it because it's easier to see here. Some bikes, um, they have what we call the anti-crush washer system. You see, how, you see how it has the metal washer inside of the green O-ring. And um, what that does is that that prevents this o-ring when it gets a little bit aged i assume uh, due to age it prevents it from failing um, and collapsing in on itself um, now i still remember you got this the seal of the the head gasket around it but um it can leak afterwards and it does leak actually i've had two or three friends probably or friends two or three times have problems after the o-ring collapsed but some bikes they just, um, I don't know which ones of which years, but they have just a single fat O-ring, and it's a small, it's pretty robust, but um, they just have the fat O-ring, the singular one, and um, that's what they do um, instead of, of this. And so my 84 was this way, and um, so if you have to, oh, and by the way, um, buy new O-rings if you're rebuilding a top end, I recommend, because these do flatten out, and they do leak, um, yes, but, um, some bikes don't have the feed, the oil feed, and some head gaskets just have beads of sealer all around them. So, um, but this one, as I said, if you have an anti-crush washer, I really like this style. If you have a chance to upgrade for any reason, or any opportunity to buy a gasket that has the larger hole, and you have to make sure your cylinder has the large hole too. A lot of cylinders have a small hole, um, and uh, then you can only use this one anyway. But make sure the cylinder has a large enough hole to take it, and um, you can then you can install um, this kind of style of it's more reliable um, and it is um, how, how do you say well it's just more reliable we'll, we'll put it that way um, however at this point though you might not 
need to put this in. Okay, the reason is, is because when you put the head on, and um, you have to pick up the cam chain in order to um, move it, or in order to not pinch it, sometimes you can bump the gasket a few times, and uh, of course it's not going to do it for me this time, and um, the o-ring can start to walk its way out, and you see it's not fastened down by anything, and then plonk, it falls out. And um, while well, you're not paying attention, or you're paying attention only to the head, and you tighten the head down, and then you look down and you see that, and you go, oh, I've got to do it again. Um, so what I do sometimes is I'll put the head on first, kind of thread the chain through so that it's not pinching, and right just before I tighten it down, I will grab the o-ring and stuff it in there, and then plonk the head on top of it. But I'm going to put the o-ring in first this time, just because I've only got one available hand. Um, because of this camera nonsense. Okay, so when you're installing a head, make sure that o-ring is there, if you have one. If you don't, um, some gaskets don't have that, okay? So it's all up to you to determine if you have one. Take, what I like to do is I bring up these two holes and I rest them on the bottom threads, or the bottom hole. I rest the threads inside. The reason I do that is so that I, if I'm not trying to center everything at once and I have a chance to scratch up the head like that, you know, contacting the head. So I'll come up from the bottom, rest the threads in here like this, and then if you look at the top, I pivot the head on those threads and that will direct me straight into the hole. So I'm going to do that again for I'll just explain that again. So you can see, bottom, pivot, get the threads in, and I'll just pivot it upwards. And it kind of guides you there. I mean, it actually pulls you, that, that was fast. But it brings you right where you need to be. And that's because you can't, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of using these two to guide you in. And it's much easier that way than trying to get all four in centered at the same time. If your head jams remember what i said about the rocker shaft sometimes if you skipped over that the rocker shaft can sometimes back out so all you need to do is get a little bolt and um and uh put inside the shaft and then push it in um so um if if you're pushing the head down and it goes well that that's almost on but it goes clonk and it stops about right there check it to make sure the rocker shaft has not backed out and is hitting the stud that will make it impossible for you to get the head on Oh, and by the way, I talked about head studs, and I said I wasn't sure about why sometimes the, only the bottom right corrodes. I figured out the reason this morning, literally this morning. And so for lunchtime, I couldn't wait to explain it to you. It's that, it's because if you see in here, if I can show you, it's not terribly apparent. Now, you can see the shaft. It's actually outside. It's exposed. The head bolt the stud is literally on the outside of the engine. Um, if I can point that out to you. So I hope I can show you. Yeah, there you go, you see that stud? There it is, right there. And it's on the outside of the engine. And so that means, of course, it's going to corrode, is because, well, it's outside. And uh, the other studs are all 100% internal. You can see that, you know, it's internal. It's in this one's going to be internal, and the one over here is going to be 100% inside. This is the oil feed side, so of course it's going to be all inside. So, um, yeah, I figured out why the bottom right one corrodes. It's because it's actually exposed to the outside, um, the elements. Um, by the way, if you, for some reason, skip that, if you have one that's starting to corrode like this, um, surface corrosion is okay, but what I like to do is I flip the studs. Um, of course, if you buy new ones, you don't have to worry. But I'd pull out, you know, if you're on a budget, and hey, this is free, so why not? Pull the bottom one out that has a little bit of corrosion, put it on top, and put the top one on the bottom. You can't flip it with the, the other side. You have to use it on the same side because these two are longer. But just flip them, and um, that way you'll get the strongest stud on the bottom, and the one that had to sit outside all the time is going to be um, inside now. And you kind of balance things out. That's just a small trick that I like to do. Um, it, it works, it helps. So anyway, but yes, that little channel in there is, um, that's, it's literally, <laughs> the the stud is on the outside. So uh, I found that very interesting, I have no idea um, about that. Okay, 
at this point, you gotta be ready to um, feed the cam chain. You, you have to pick up the cam chain, obviously, or do your best to do so. Um, how I do it is um, with two hands, I push, I kind of feed the cam chain through, or with, I guess I can do this with my right hand. You feed the cam chain through like that. Okay, and you want to hold it so that it doesn't pinch before you install the uh, you push the head all the way down also as i've said because this can catch on the lip of the head gasket like um so you can see if i let the slack off it can catch the lip of the head gasket and it can sometimes pull it off of the cylinder and if it does that you can knock the o-ring out very very easily so double double check make sure it's still in there all right, now at this point, what you can do is squish the head down like that. That was fast, okay, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but you can push the head down quickly. And um, I wanted to back it out at this point because sometimes the head will stop about right here and it doesn't want to seem to go in smoothly like the one I just showed you at the time I just showed you. And what you do is wiggle it back and forth, kind of wiggle it from the top and the bottom. Sometimes you can give it a tap with a rubber mallet. Okay, where's, oh yeah, there's my rubber mallet. And you can give it a tap. And um, that's because these little dowels, these alignment dowels, sometimes are a little bit mangled and they don't like to go in all the way. No, they don't like to go in, they're not friendly with you. So, um, but, so if you get stopped right here, do be sure that you, um, that you are aligned with those dowels too. Okay, so there's one on top, one on the bottom. And once you are, just do the wiggling. Give it a little tap. I can only use my hand. And there you go. At this point, you can tell that it is, it's not, of course, tightened down, but the O-ring and all of that is going to not fall out at this point. Um, and uh, don't, be careful not to let go of the chain and let it fall all the way down like I almost did. Um, if you have this little three cam, this three bolt cam like I do, I, I just like to slip the cam over like that for now, or the chain over for that right now. And um, But obviously if you have this one you can't do that. So um, in that case I'll show you what I do um, so that the chain doesn't fall down. What you can do to keep the cam chain from falling down, take one of your cam bolts um, like this, thread it in a few notches, a uh, thre few notches, th few threads, and then, and then you can drop the cam chain on that bolt, and that way it won't fall down as easily. Um, so if you're you know tapping something or wiggling it around and the cam chain falls off. Um, it won't sink all the way back into the cylinder and you have to try and fish it out. Usually you can fish it out, but you know, this just gives you a little bit of a, um, this This just makes sure that, it ensures that it doesn't happen to you. Um, something really unlucky doesn't happen to you. Next step, you're gonna put in this locating bolt, for lack of better wording. It's the same kind of bolt or screw, I guess, um, a cross head as this. It's a 10 millimeter head put it in and sometimes it doesn't start because the head is actually sitting somewhat at a crooked angle so you will have to align it this one I believe is already aligned because of the alignment dowels and um, have done their job but uh, sometimes I've, I've seen it to where the heads don't sit straight so um, just um, if it's not going in you can do a little wiggling back and forth of the head so that it um, lines up with this also, if you're wondering, if one of you had those, if you lost one of the dowels inside and you kind of want an emergency rebuild, um, you can use um, one dowel if you want, or none. I've done none before. I don't totally recommend it because the head might not sit completely no, no, straight on the, the engine. But um, if you, you see how this has a little collar in here. You know, it's, those are not threads in there. Those are not threads. Um, you got to back it out quite a ways before you actually get to the threads, I've noticed that as long as I put this on here without really tightening it down, 
and you kind of wiggle it until it feels very centered and it looks like it's matching to the ball and everything um, and, and then you, or you give it a slight cinching down so it doesn't move as much um, I've, I've done that and I've had, I haven't had problems with the engine working afterwards um, it's worked for um, friends out in the countryside so um, in case you're wondering yes you can do it without it but um, if you can, of course, get the alignment dowels, it makes your job easier, the head's going to sit completely straight, and you're not going to run into problems in the future, just my opinion on that matter. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about, about this and why you don't want to tighten these bolts all the way down, um, or even tightly, tightly. Um, a little bit of cinching is okay, but what happens is, um, and this is why it's so important to, to get stuff from a good factory, um, that has good practices and all of that and has skilled workers you might think oh it's so easy to assemble something but no 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 no. blue collar workers um, have to be skilled as well so um, um by the way see how much i'm cinching it just just like with my fingers and then as soon as it's finger tight i let go okay it's it's, it's that's all i'm doing it's just finger tight yeah three fingers ish and um that that's it that's all i do uh, i stop right there um, what happened is I bought a knife and motor back in 2012, 2013-ish, and um, I had, it, I don't remember if it was 100 or 1,000 kilometers, it was rel ridiculously low. Um, I, it died, it, it must have been 100 because it died a week later, and um, so I don't, it went 1,000 in a week. So about probably about 100 kilometers or maybe 150, and um, it was a knife and 110, the full speed, the secondary clutch motor, and uh, the hand gasket went. Um, well, I mean, it just quit running, and so of course I had to uh, get a lift home. And um, the the um, the problem, I I mean, after I took apart the engine, I found on the cylinder head. So not this one. This is my cub head, but I'm just showing you for example. There was this almost like a straight jet of it was like this big cloud of burn mark on this side of the engine, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But it had, it, and the metal had scored too, so it was really hot. Um, so a lot of gas had escaped from here, and I couldn't figure out what was going on because this side was completely fine; and there was nothing wrong with that. And uh, but the, the head gasket had burned all the way through on this side, and um, I couldn't. I, I thought, what in the world is going on? Now, why did it do that? Because um, obviously I can put it back together, but if the head is crooked or something, you know, it would um, it, it wouldn't help. But I milled that had the head milled. And it was fine. It was it, it was completely flat, and um, it seemed the original head was flat too. So it, it wasn't warped. I didn't understand. And then it occurred to me when I realised, hang on a second. Usually head gaskets they they kind of they either fail because it's not enough clamping force, or the gasket itself collapses. Okay, so it goes it squishes down too flat, and then the gases escape all around the ring of the gasket um, around there. And um, I'm going to put my picture of my failed gasket on my other bike, not the Lifan, my other bike that failed due to clamping force, uh, not enough clamping force from the head studs, and that picture is here. And you can see there's that ring of um, the black carbon is escaping all the way around. And by the way, yes, I know it's running a little bit rich, that's why there's a bunch of black in there. That's not oil, it was just running rich at the time. And um, But yeah, it had... I mean, that's the kind of failure I'm used to, and not a failure over here. Well, what I realized happened, or what I conclude must have happened though, was that um, because so much of the motor was really put together kind of funny, it was the assembly worker wasn't very good. Um, sorry, I mean, I know Mr. Mr. Chinese man probably had a... He probably wasn't happy to be there or something. I can't imagine the, the factory conditions were any good. Point being, though, is that when that the top end was put down, uh, put on, I am willing to bet you that instead of using these as locating screws or just retaining screws to hold the top end together, rather than, um, or, yeah, just to hold the top end together, I bet what he did was he tightened down these two screws all the way, you know, torqued them all the way, and what that would have done was that would have pulled the head off. To just crooked. I'm not talking you know, at, a, at a noticeable angle. I just mean it. It just it's slightly crooked, and so what that did was, and that makes sense because this side was all sealed off. But this is the side that was lifting and it was burning, and so when the engine was running, it was pushing the head just off enough to where that the the exhaust gases were escaping and eventually burnt a hole through the gasket. 
Um, so that is um, that was my conclusion on that. And the reason I say that I, I assume that is because I'll put the engine together myself. I even replaced it with a life and head gasket and it worked fine. No problem whatsoever. And uh, I believe that bike is still live today. That was 2012 when I had that bike and it's 2017 now. I sold it to my friend and uh, best I know, to the best of my knowledge, it's still going. I mean, the rest of the bike has fallen apart, but I mean, the engine's still going. Um, so um, that's it. Uh, that's just a little story for you about why I like um, or why I'm um, having skilled workers and that know what they're doing even on the assembly level is so important so don't think that you're better than some other people you know because oh I've got myself a degree or whatnot you know no 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 if you are good at what you do you, you can add so much value to the economy by simply I mean how much time did I have to waste just because that worker tightened down these two bolts first instead of tightening down the head knots I mean, I blew the head gasket, I had to pull the whole engine apart, you know, I was out a bike, that was my delivery bike for my workers. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yes, don't shoot down blue collar workers just because they, they're doing dirty jobs like this, you know. Um, it's, um, we, uh, we are just as important as the people up top, and we all have different, um, not just as important, but, you know, we have an important job to do too. So, uh, go blue collar power. I'm going to end my rant there. You can probably tell I am one of those laborers. Um, that's the, the kind of class I come from, is the labor class. So, the next part I'm going to, um, that we are going to put in, is the cam sprocket. Um, but, if you have a, if you're putting, sometimes, if you have a brand new cam chain, and you have an Astria, or an Astria, excuse me, I don't know what I just, why I said that, if you're putting in a brand new cam chain, and a fresh, engine rebuild and with new gaskets and everything um, instead of just removing the head and removing the cam chain um, so if you have all brand new parts not all of them have compressed yet and I've found that um, you can run right at the limits of your cam chain um, if you're putting all new parts in you know new new these new that everything new um, and so sometimes what you want to do is you want to actually talk down the cylinder head first but um, I'm not going to do that here because I'm not going to run into that problem here. But if you can't get the cylinder head, uh, if you can't get the cam chain gear in first, um, then torque down this and it should be able to fit okay because sometimes the gaskets haven't compressed and um, and the hardware is all new and all that, you know, this is all new and stuff. Um, I've had it happen a couple of times, not often, that's why I'm not doing it, but I'm just saying, you know, if, if you do encounter that problem, be aware. All right. Now, I've already set this engine to top dead center, and um, if you're not sure what top dead center feels like, and this is another reason I, um, I'm not sure why I said this is another reason I'm going off on tangents. And um, now I've already set it to top dead center, so I knew it was there. And remember when I said one that um, if if you watch that top end video, um, the once you get to that point of um, where the cylinder's at the top, it's going to kind of bump back and forth like this. And so that's how you know you're at top dead center. Now, if it bumps all the way to the right and all the way to the left, it's still okay. That's still top dead center. It's still within, you know, limits. But if you, you bring it down any amount like this, then you have to go backwards until you find top dead center. And then once you find it, and, and by the way, you're going to be doing this, if you can't really see it, um, you can check by feeding in a straw, or if you're Asian and you have a chopstick, you can use that. Um, and to and then you wiggle the flywheel back and forth until what you're going to see is you're going to see just imagine this is a top and you're going to see the bolt come up to the top or whatever it is it's going to come up to the top and then it's going to just stay there even if though you're rotating the flywheel so it'll look like this it'll be coming up and it'll stay you're still rotating the flywheel and then it'll gradually start to go down then it'll come up and then um, and then it'll pause and then it'll go down as you're rotating the flywheel. Oh, and if you rotate it, rotate it anti-clockwise, um, because that's the direction that the engine spins. Um, and also what can happen is if your, your oil drive gear um, can also start backing out, then it can kind of move sideways a little bit if you're rotating it clockwise. So rotate it anti-clockwise. Um, so 
So um, yes, you re so that's how you find top dead center. Make sure you find it. Um, that's one way to find it. Also, you can use the method of if the cylinder head is off, obviously, you can just watch the piston from the cylinder side. In case of there's no head, you can just watch the piston. But make sure you're top dead center. Um, that's how I find it. I like to find it mechanically because sometimes oh, I've found this on pit bikes too. I promise you, I'm not trying to trash pit bikes and their Chinese manufacturers. Um, it's not because I'm Japanese and I hate Chinese people or anything. No, it's just what's happened to me. And so I'm not. And um, by the way, I have Chinese friends, some, not many. But um, the, the point is, I'm not trying to be racist here. It's just that I have run into these problems with pit bike parts. So I hope you understand that. And um, so anyway, I've had it to where the marks on the stator, on the, on the flywheel, on the magneto, were completely backwards. They were 180 and um, are, are not backwards. Would it have been backwards or not? No, no, the, the marks, okay, sorry, they were 90 degrees out. That's right. They were 90 degrees out. And so you try and, uh, you'd think you're at top dead center. If you're just, um, if you're trying to match it up with the, the marks on the plates and uh, on the plate and whatnot, or if you have your cover on and you match up the marks, and then if you only go by the marks and they're not correct, then, well, you're not at top dead center. And um, that throws everything off. And so um, that just wanted to, uh, yeah, just letting you know that uh, that is possible, that the timing marks are not stra uh, stamped in the correct place, okay? Um, it's not always the case, and I'm sure that the European market has a bit better stuff. I don't know. I've no idea. I've never bought pit bike stuff in Europe before. But um, that's just something I wanted to um, um, tell you. This is why I like to find top dead center mechanically. If I can see the piston is at the top, I know I'm at the top. It's not like a, the piston is magically here and there, like some sort of quantum phenomena, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, just keep going on. But this, these are the things that have wasted so much time for me as I was trying to build the engine. And so I want to share them with you so you don't run into the same problems that I do, okay? Um, this, um, if, if this... If you don't sort of secure it down, you don't have to tighten it down, but if you don't sort of secure it, be careful, this can fall off. And if it lands on your foot, this thing is massive. It will do damage. Um, I have actually, I, I don't know if I broke my toe or not. I've had a flywheel land on it before. And all I know is that it hurt for months. So it was probably broken and then it healed. And um, so yeah, be careful. This flywheel, if it falls off and lands on your foot, uh, that will be, um, that will hurt like a booger. So, 